Hey, today is August 14th, 2017, and you're listening to Human Factors Cast. We're on episode 53. It's crazy to think that we have over two days of content. So anyway, I try not to flood the podcast with personal interest, but sometimes it's the will of the VR gods that we cover some of these stories. So we'll be talking about some of that, some robotics. That's right, we're covering stories from Disney's soft robots, teleportation to a crime scene. Human Factors Cast is the only podcast now available on your human brain interface, and it starts right now. Let's do this thing. Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Everybody, welcome back to another episode of Human Factors Cast. I'm your host, Nick Rome, not messing up the intro this week. I'm joined today by my good friend and yours, Mr. Blake Arnsdorf. Everybody, give Nick a round of applause for not messing up the intro. Yeah! <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, Nick, well, how are you, man? It's good to be back and on another Monday night. It is good to be back. Are, are you Are you still across the pond? Is it Monday night for you? Are you... It is... Indeed, Monday night for me, but I am now in the States, hanging out in New Jersey with some family. Well, welcome back to the States. Oh, it feels so good. <laughs> well, man, I, I got to ask you, what's been what's been going on with you lately? So you're, you're back in the States. Oh, yeah. So I'm back in the States doing the same old stuff. But Nick, there's something that has been bothering me relentlessly with what companies are doing with their websites and applications. Oh, so boy. I'm going to gripe a little bit in the beginning of the podcast oh to get boy. out of my system. I am so excited for this because I saw your note, and I have experienced this pain, too. Go ahead. Okay. So I don't know if anybody else really has noticed this, but there's a lot of websites that are trying to get you to use their mobile app. Now, I totally understand the desire for them to have you use their app and be faster or better or more optimizing, optimized for the experience, right? But there's just some times that I don't either have the space on my phone or I just don't want to listen to what the company wants me to do, right? Sure. Uh, so I, I get pretty angry about this. And uh, one company that does this is Pinterest. Like You can't access some of, some of the content or it's not as fast if you just go through their web browser, um, and LinkedIn's another one where I just kind of I refuse a little bit to just download the app. I don't really know right. why I probably should, but it, it drives me nuts if I've got like a connection request in an email, let's say, and then it bombards me with all this kind of adsy looking content about, oh, download a mobile app, that kind of stuff. Right, so right. I have a little bit of a problem with it, right? Sure. Well, so on Apple's, on like uh, just the iPhone, there used to be this app called the TV app, and I had no idea what it was for. Okay. Uninstalled it, whatever. So I have all my streaming services that I use through my app sometimes when I'm traveling, especially on planes and stuff like that. Um, and recently, I tried to watch something through Netflix, and it forced me to grab this iOS TV app. Now, of course, Nick, at first, I was pretty pissed off because right, like, right, okay right. you're now you're requiring me to use a piece of software that i don't necessarily think i need sure but in, in this case apple actually makes it easier for you by allowing you to search all of your streaming content or any content you own through apple or any other service through one place instead of having to access a bunch of different apps oh man that's that's pretty money yeah, so it, it, in this case, it was a genius move. I mean, it made me a little angry at first, but only to to win me over in the end. So that's my gripe session for the podcast today. Well, I think it ended on a positive note. You you were really upset about it, and then and then you realized that they were just doing something in your best interest. Yeah, that's a it's a funny thing about UX, right? You never know what you're gonna get. So Nick, what has been going on with you, man? Well, uh, have you okay? So I'm um, I have to look up the name. Uh, but have you heard about that there is going to be a hyper reality experience? Now, um, before I get into the IP, which I mean, I'm, I'm sure some people can already infer. Uh, <laughs> but have you have you heard of hyper reality? <laughs> no, I was going to make you explain that if you knew what it was. So <laughs> I have never heard this term before. But Lucasfilm and Star Wars, oh, big surprise there, uh, <laughs> are putting together. <laughs> I know they're putting together this this experience called the void um which is a hyper reality experience or or sorry sorry no the void and ilm x lab are creating this thing it's called star wars secrets of the empire 
right? And it's going to plunge Star Wars fans into the universe. It's it's basically um, it's it's VR, right? So that's that's at the crux of it. But I think uh, just glancing over the article here, it looks like the hyper reality aspect of it is they're going to be blowing wind on you and you're going to feel heat and uh, potentially, you know, fight with a Sith Lord or something. I don't know. Um, you know, and, and there's not a whole lot of details out there right now, but they're talking about this in, in broad strokes and very sort of um, uh, very big words. <laughs> Magic of illusions, advanced technology, virtual reality, immersive social experiences, right? And uh, they, they call it a truly transformative experience is so much more than what you see with your eyes. It's what you hear, feel, touch, and even smell. So hence hyper reality, I guess that's hyper reality. I guess it's when it's masks all your senses. I'm not sure. Is there an actual search term for hyper reality right now? Hmm. Let's see. Well, there's a hyper reality video on YouTube. Let's see. Hyper, oh, hyper reality. Oh, it's a concept film. Inability of consciousness to distinguish reality from a st- simulation of reality, especially in technology, uh, technology. All right. I buy in. I'm down. Yeah. I'm ready seriously. for this thing, man. <laughs> so when is this thing coming out or where is it going to be? So it's going to be in downtown Disney and uh, I forget the Florida one. The, um, uh, what is it called? Disney Springs. Now, I don't see a release date on here, uh, but I think it should come out sometime next year. But, uh, oh, wait. No, this holiday season. Oh, this just made me ten times more excited. <laughs> yeah, so uh, you can you can find me at Downtown Disney this this holiday season. <laughs> Blake, want to go? Oh man, yeah, I do. <laughs> Let's I think do we it. Do like a live little thing from it. It'd be sweet. Yeah, yeah. I uh, I, I looked at pricing. I think it's like fifty dollars a person, or, or maybe they haven't revealed pricing. But there's a similar experience, and I think it's priced at fifty. So who knows? But it's in Downtown Disney, so you don't have to pay a whole Disneyland ticket. But that's what's going. That's that's some of the things that going on in my life, man. I have to say, so you and I worked together about a year ago, and yes, uh, we and actually this particular note you have in here made me laugh so hard. <laughs> I'm sure it did. I'm kind of embarrassed about it. I'm sure it did because uh, when we shared the same office, we uh, there there was a point where I was working on a project that required uh, doing advanced task flows, and uh, well, surprise, surprise, I'm working on another project that it requires advanced task flows. And uh, sticky notes are back in full force. And and just to give the listeners some perspective, like last year, the entire office was covered in sticky notes. I'm I'm talking. We have like probably uh, probably close to twenty feet of window in the office, and it was all from ceiling to floor covered in sticky notes. Now, listeners, I would like you to imagine the fact that Nick has a co- is in a corner, so he's got two of these giant windows on either side, plus one that's kind of in the middle of the room, if you're in the same place you were. I am. Um, and he would cover these windows with these giant, basically, what do you call them? Almost like giant post-it notes. They're giant with, sticky notes with, with sticky s- notes smaller them. sticky notes on them, yeah. It, w- it was a pretty insane little spectacle, but I mean, it seemed to work really well for you guys, but it was always hilarious seeing just the rainbow and myriad of sticky notes when I would come in in the morning. Oh, for sure. So I'm here to report that sticky notes are a seasonal occurrence in my life now. So every every fall or, or end of summer, it looks like uh, sticky notes will be a, uh, for lack of a better term, sticky in my life. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man. Well, I'm glad everything is good. Are you ready to move on to the news, my man? Yeah, man. Let's get into Human Factors News. This is going to be the sh- part of the show all about Human Factors News. This could be anything from medical, transportation, psychology, AI, VR, automation, design. What else we got? I don't ev- Everything. Robotics. Anything as long as it has to do with the field of Human Factors. So, Blake, what do we got up first this week? All right. So, First up, we're talking about phone numbers a little bit. So believe it or not, when WhatsApp was released, it wasn't even a messaging app. Its founder, Jan, hope I'm saying this right, Coom, simply thought it would be a neat need to open his address book on his phone and see status messages like I'm at the gym or I'm in a meeting next to his friends' names. He knew no one would want to endure the pain of creating yet another username and password or joining another social network just to know what your friends were up to. 
So Coom let people log into WhatsApp with the one thing that everyone has these days, a phone number. So now apps like Snapchat, Twitter, and Facebook Messenger, Facebook Messenger have followed suit. So phone numbers are now killing the username, killing the password, and making it easier than ever to go wild online. So guard it with your life, because your phone number is becoming your life. Now, I thought about this a little bit, Nick, and I didn't realize that that was what, like, what apps like WhatsApp or even the Snapchat or Snapchat or Twitter were using to kind of safeguard some of your data was your phone number. Oh yeah. 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 Um, so I, I want to comment on this too, because it's not just your username that you can use your phone as you can use your phone as two factor authentication. So, you know, you, you put your information in and, and you, you want to log into a web service of some type and you put in your username and password and then it sends you a code on your phone and you put that code in it's verifying that you are who you say you are. Now, there, not only that, but there, there are authenticator apps on your phone that if you're like, okay, for example, I just used the Blizzard authenticator today. So I logged into my Blizzard account for the first time in a couple months, uh, a couple years actually, and uh, no, a couple months. And, um, and uh, I, I logged in and it actually sent a push notification to my phone that said, is this you? And then accept it. So all I had to do was accept, and it sent that back through its servers to, to, uh, to the data center, and boom, it just let me in on the computer. It was quite amazing, and it really got me thinking about how much you know your phone really is an extension of you now. Oh yeah, and I mean, there's, and it made me think about the fact that I've used, like you said, the BattleNet kind of authenticator, but also too, you've got. Um, like Gmail, this this is what I learned in grad school when I, my Gmail account got hacked was using two-factor authentication, but they've even kind of made it more seamless without you having to have a any kind of extra software. They just have right. it built into the UI as you go, and they send you an SMS uh, to be able to log into your account, which, may, which safeguards it a whole heck of a lot more than even if you change your password a lot more frequently. Yeah, so, I mean, there's this whole shift, right? Like, your phone used to just be something that people could reach you at and now it's an extension of your digital self right you lose your phone you lose your life i mean you lose access to a lot of the things that you hold near and dear on the web like it, it's just yeah it's crazy to think about it this way yeah it is the i guess the only kind of saving grace there right is like let's say you unfortunately let's say you do lose your phone but you've password protected it i mean a lot of your stuff still can't even got, get people still can't really get into it. And there's a lot of pretty good safeguards about lo- about it. This is kind of a little, little big brotherish, but I know that a lot of the safeguards that I experienced when I was traveling overseas was even in my two factor authentication for, let's say like Gmail, it would ask me my security questions because it noticed, Hey, you're really out of a place that you're not normally in. So, I mean, even the, the just thoughts behind some of these security systems that are linked to your phone number have gotten a lot more intricate. Yeah, and I mean, okay, so it's you brought up a good point. So think about this. So you're trying to log in to a website. So you, you put your username and password in, and then it sends you a code. And on your phone, you have to unlock your phone, so you have to know the password for the phone. And then you have to know where to look for the Messenger app or the Authenticator app. And then you have to grab that and then put it back in the system. And then, like, just this whole process it kind of impresses me actually like I'm, I'm actually <laughs> when you think about the logistics of the whole thing, it's quite impressive. Oh yeah. To make it work and all oh, yeah. those kinds of things. So anyway, this article from wired uh, really kind of breaks down and it's kind of a story, right? About how sort of um, the origins of this whole thing. It's definitely worth a read uh, for, for any of our listeners interested in the full story, but uh, it, it was just kind of interesting, and I, I thought we could we could talk about it on the show. So, yeah, yeah, definitely a good one, a good pick for the week. Yeah, all right. So let's go ahead and move on to the next one. This is the reason why I was on uh, Blizzard. Uh, <laughs> Blizzard. Oh, nice. Battlenet. Cool. You'll have some. You'll have some stuff to talk about. All right. Yes. So, th- getting into Blizzard, like Nick was saying. So, StarCraft Two has a target has been a target for Alphabet's Deep Mind AI research for a while now. The UK AI company took on Blizzard's sci-fi strategy game starting last year and announced 
plans to create an open AI research environment based on the game so others could contribute to the effort of creating a virtual agent who can best the top human StarCraft players in the world. Now DeepMind and Blizzard are opening up the doors to that environment with new tools including a machine learning API, a large gameplay replay data set, and an open source DeepMind tool set as well as some more goodies on the way. So Nick, did you go and try and download this? No, uh, I was just trying to see if I had the license for StarCraft 2 and I do not. <laughs> <laughs> Dang, very tree for both of us. Then. But dude, okay, so there's there's a lot of AI stuff going on this week. So did you hear about so so this? We'll we'll get back to this. But did you hear that um, the Dota Dota two right? Um, and and you know our golden boy Elon Musk and his company OpenAI, right? So he uh, Elon Musk actually tweeted earlier this week. OpenAI is the first ever to defeat world's best players in competitive esports vastly more complex. yeah yeah you're right a bunch of uh, like esports tweets from him earlier this week yeah he continues on vastly more complex than traditional board games like chess and go so yeah there is um uh yeah so so ai beat one of the world's top dota 2 players so and the intricacies of these games there is a lot going on right there's a lot of systems and subsystems that you have to sort of understand very intimately in order to uh, sort of play these games effectively. And then you have to sort of, there's that whole understanding comprehension piece. And then there's the whole anticipatory uh, design of it. So you have to anticipate your, your enemies moves. And it's, it's, it's amazing to me that we're building systems that can, um, uh, that, that can play better than humans at these things. So this is this is all kind of inter- interesting in the fact that recently this week, for whatever reason, I picked up. Uh, I think it's the Singularity is near. It's one <laughs> of Ray Kurzweil's books, and yeah. he talk he spends a lot of time talking about exponential growth and how in technology that's almost you know amplified to a certain degree. And here, this is like kind of a perfect example of that, right? Like the companies spent such a long time trying to create AI that could beat players in the board game chess because that's a big strategy game and then go as well and i mean that took some serious time and effort to get to those places well now think about the leap ahead we're taking with trying to dive into games like dota but more so for me starcraft because there's so much going on in starcraft that you have to do and be thinking about and processing and there's a lot of chance in it in that you can't see what's going on at the map at all times either right so it's just this giant exponential growth and how much we're let or how much ai is being able to do and now i'm assuming that's going to even be ramped up more because what they're doing here is they're releasing this to the public to open source it so it'll have more data that can gather and be able to make better decisions and probably more quickly be able to beat players yeah i i find it funny that this was released on uh, this this article uh, from TechCrunch was on August 9th. And then Elon Musk tweets his tweet on August 11th. And it's almost like they're in a, I, I there's gotta be some competitive uh, thing going on because it's like they announced that they're doing this. And then Elon Musk comes out and says, ha, we did it better than you. Oh, that's interesting. Or, we did do, it faster who, than you. Do you know who owns Dota? Um, that's Valve. Yeah. That's, that's pretty funny. You have like two really big competitors just, in different fields competing with each other across this AI spectrum. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's almost like these are two halves to the same story, but we posted the blizzard one. So, I mean, you know, but, but yeah, I mean, it's think about the applications of this, right. It goes far beyond games, right. So bringing it back to the field of human factors, can you imagine? So, so they're, they're trying to learn most, most effective ways for AI to learn these strategies. And if you, if you apply that in, in the real world, right. With, with, um, managing and and generating resources and commanding military units right deploying defensive structures all these things if you apply these to the real world holy crap well think about it in that context you just mentioned there too i mean this is allowing ai systems to see how they better can problem solve in a quick manner what if what if something like this is used as kind of like a simulator to see how things would play out or as a decision aid for a commander or whomever would need it oh, sure. in any kind of military con- context. Sorry. Um, that con but there's just a lot of possibilities, especially since this is like strategy based. Um, 
But I, I really wonder how long it's going to take for uh, for AI to beat a player in this complex game. Yeah, I don't know. And I'd be interested to see what the difference between StarCraft 2 and Dota 2 are, just in terms of number of systems to uh, to learn. I can't really speak to either one of these. Like, I haven't, I haven't played StarCraft 2. I haven't played Dota 2. Um, I have played other MOBAs and uh, RTSs. Um, so... You know, and they are two different genres of games, so there's that to understand as well. But just to kind of understand how many systems are at play and what the AI has to understand in order to beat a human player, uh, maybe maybe I'll do some research on that. But uh, do you have any other thoughts on this one before I move on? No, I, I think I'm pretty good on this one. I'm just it's uh, it, I like that you pointed out that Elon Musk had already kind of beat. <laughs> I know. Beating deep mind to the punch. I think that's an interesting take on the story for the week. <laughs> Mr. Golden Boy. All right. Well, I want to thank all of our friends over at IEEE, IEEE, uh, TechCrunch, Wired, and The Next Web for all of our stories this week. And if you guys want to follow along with the stories as we find them, follow us all over social media for links to those original articles. It's a great place to keep up to date with what we're going to be talking about on the show ahead of time so you can do your research and know what we're talking about. All right, Blake, what do we got up next? All right, so imagine putting on that VR headset, seeing the virtual world take shape around you, and then navigating through that world without waving any controllers around. Man, that sounds like paradise. I know, right? So instead here, you'd be steering around with your thoughts alone. That's the new gaming experience offered by the startup Neurable, which unveiled the world's first mind-controlled VR game at SIGGRAPH conference this week. Neurable CEO Ramsey's Akhaled told Spectrum, IEEE Spectrum that he believes thought controlled interfaces will make virtual reality a ubiquitous technology. Now, I, I hardly can believe that. Just a little background here. So, for this particular uh, startup, all the, they've retrofitted. I think they said in the article an HTC Vive with basically some no or some squids for monitoring brain activity in specific areas, of course. But I can't believe that this guy actually thinks that this is going to be ubiquitous with the technology of VR. Because I always thought the controllers would have to be there for some reason. Hmm. What are you thinking? I I can see it. I mean, I, look, man, we're we're getting into this this age of human brain interfaces where I just don't know what to think anymore. Cause okay. So it's that whole dichotomy that we've talked about on the show before, right? Of, Oh, this is great. I can control things with my mind. Oh wait, this computer program is in my mind or, you know, this, this company is in my mind. Uh, So I, okay. So your argument is that it's not going to be ubiquitous because you need the controllers in some aspect, right? It's not actually that. I'm just surprised by it for whatever reason. Maybe it's me not understanding AI enough or being forward thinking enough to think like, oh, you don't necessarily need controllers. I'm just used to that from video gaming for so long, right? Yeah, well, look at it, look at it this way. So you send controls down your spinal cord, right? And if you can if you can tap into I know this is like super science fiction y and and who knows how far off this is, but okay. So you tap into your spinal cord. It reads those signals. So then that then becomes your controller. You no longer have to do anything. You have, um, essentially an avatar that is one-to-one with your own body and it intercepts sort of these, these, um, uh, these thoughts or, or controls to your body and, relates them into the virtual environment. That's like down the road. I think what this is doing is you think something and it does something. So that's that I I can see I get I don't why why would you need controllers with that? I'm trying to <laughs> I'm trying to understand why if if you get high enough resolution on this uh human brain interface to what the human operator is trying to do in these situations. Uh, I, I just to the west. Okay, stop. I want to make a right. Okay, look at that thing. Oh, I guess I can move my head. Look at that thing over there. Look at that thing over there. All right, move ten paces forward. But I'm gonna I'm gonna hold this thing in my hands. Okay, so my avatar does that. Like, there's no limit to what you can do with your mind. Barrier there for me is how do you manage feedback from those objects that you're thinking about touching now? I mean, for from the article, it talks more about this is more groundbreaking than what's things off of nodes versus right. just EEGs. So it's giving, it's letting you like once you have an intent about thinking about moving your arm, that it it isn't really moving. 
but I feel right. that there's really any particular need uh, for moving about a VR encoded. If you if I really think about it, I mean, you're just now assigning. Imagine, imagine that system I just described, right, where it intercepts your your uh, spinal cord. Now, now we feel like you're touching all this stuff, even though you're not. That's yeah. It would provide yeah. you. Some- <laughs> Have you seen that one yet? I don't know if I've seen it. I'm not sure. You're good. I didn't spoil anything for you. He's safe, thank God. You're you're good. I wouldn't I wouldn't dare piss off our lead. That no, let's not. All right. Uh, okay. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Are you ready to move on here? Let's do it. All right. Let's talk some more VR because this one is my favorite story of the week. Yeah, this is this is definitely in the top for me as well. All right, so juries are seldom allowed to actually visit the physical crime scene. There are exceptions, usually in difficult, high-profile murder cases, such as in the case of O.J. Simpson finders. You are you introduce a myriad of problems from possible biases. However, new technology is now emerging that could enable crime scene investigators to capture and videography robotics and virtual reality. So, for example, researchers that the headsets, such as the Oculus Rift and HTC Vive, to reproduce virtual crime scene. There is, do you see, I see one problem with kind of using this approach of these. Real- if, if, there, if the infrastructure is there to where uh, these boom as a uh, gavel, you know, like, oh, well, everybody put on your VR headsets. Let's visit, visit the crime scene. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah, and I think that this, not to the point where this technology just becomes, you know, commonplace yet. Ultra immersive 360 degree video, similar to what we were talking about above with videography, it's like headset from like Google Cardboard. So there are ways around the expense problem to bring this. Providing a 3D representation of the crime scene uh, may be a good thing in going, wow, I am here. in And this person who you know, visceral about VR already because it masks your senses and it kind of puts you in this environment. That's this app on my phone. That's, um, shoot. I wish I remember what it was. I think it's cardboard, uh, these pictures in Google cardboard and I could actually see it in 3d. And I looked at it just the other day, um, to kind of get this experience and I can just imagine how sort of haunting it might be. Uh, if you put it in, I guess, really affect the psyche of jurors. Yeah. Uh, but that's what one I'm getting thing at. on that. Yeah, version of or a different version, perhaps of PTSD. And well, what would be even more? In- oh, put the person who's on trial <laughs> in that in the thinking about ethics. The uh, the cool thing the article points out that I, I know probably a lot of people may be looking on who's giving you like what set of photographs or is it was it taken for face and not right. have anything really affecting how they're looking at it. It's just their own interpretation, which I think, I think I've told you before, but my girlfriend's studying to become a, a forensic pathologist and then he advanced, like it could, it could happen. Oh, it can happen. I mean, this to you or be able to take over what you're doing now. Well, yeah. And I told her, I was like, yeah, which, which that's a really good point. And I mean, that, is probably what a lot of jobs will become is. And then what do you do? Yeah. Only the time will tell, man. Only the time. So oh, yeah. It's but... all very, very cool. <laughs> That's a really great point. What, why don't you just put the jury in a cave? But don't worry. We got some more after this. Oh, yeah. Okay. So a little bit of a fun-loving story. Kids love most at Disneyland. Probably it is meeting, greeting, and snapping a photo adapted for physical interaction with humans, particularly particularly with children, and the robots also reduced impacts on collision during human interaction. Now, is heart rate... And, and, you know, I think... I don't... Uh, so, I don't want to... would react. And by programming them, they... Um, to be sensors on these things... Now, I don't know about you, man, but like I know likely it'll have to record a good chunk of whatever's going on to learn from that they, that happen. Well, surely, <laughs> I mean, the, the one thing to think about too power over me. Uh, so, I mean, there's going to be have to be a lot of thought put in in the article. One way they might test this is they're going to release some of these like quote unquote soft robots that reminded me. So have you been, <laughs> you've been keeping up with any of the star Wars news? Go Google Porg really quick. P O R G. That. Oh uh, my goodness. Were unveiled. <laughs> I know they're the new creatures that are not star Wars related. Note. Disney is getting really good at robots. 
I put this lens they're able to accomplish with robots now are just astounding, right? And just see like Yeah, I mean the the chest and all that's very stiff, but the thing. um sort of put that on top of their characters. Oh man, this is going to be awesome. Um please do a lot of user physical testing for these things. This is dangerous in some regards. <laughs> yeah. Let's look back. Today was pretty morbid, right? We talked about crime scenes, we talked about uh Andreas Andreas? UX Andreas. <laughs> and Andreas writes, hashtag. And uh, <laughs> I don't know how to Twitter. This is. <laughs> I don't, I, because this is such a broad based question, I feel like I could sit here and talk to you guys for the rest of the evening. You can kind of relate it to what was going on with Facebook trying to figure out how they can beam there. Because um, that allows some of the, uh, allows like the sharing information. That's the infrastructure. Piece. To, the yeah, in- and you can get, yeah. get like access to open source tools that cat down is a big one jumping in really quick yeah uh bill nye seems to think that that's the answer to uh them as well is you know get them the infrastructure required to at least even get on the anything you want uh provided there are not you know rules and laws that type of b- online behavior right so so yeah it's that infrastructure i i totally can here is potentially you're we're talking about countries that are not totally industrialized so the introduction of like automation for let's say manufacturing cars or food so you can have a sustainable food source instead of relying on so much potentially exporting of goods that might be a way to look at it um also getting back to the infrastructure part like we're talking a lot recently in the news definitely on this show at least it seems is like the automation automated vehicles and self-driving cars well, maybe in third world countries, if you don't have potentially as many vehicles that are available or most ho- households don't have them, but it would be necessary for you to want be able to travel to get to work, having these bigger, maybe automated kind of like lift lines um, for, argu- for argument's sake. So like a, a ride share car that picks up a bunch of people and takes them to the same like area that they would work in. You know, So introducing automation that way would be cool. You know, jumping in here, I, I think even that one might even, they might even piggyback us in terms of efficiency and, you know, how at least sort of the technology aspect of it, right? Because if you think about it, we have to sort of design around this whole uh, concept of, yeah, we have some cars that we drive ourselves and then we have some cars that are autonomous and then we have really old cars and really new cars and certain cars get certain gas fuel efficiency and and yeah but but if you were to design a system in a third world country where that doesn't even exist and just you know here's everything's autonomous you don't have to worry about safety because they all talk to each other like you don't have to worry about that human element anymore it's just it's all there right they could they could potentially piggyback us in a lot of aspects these third world countries or less developed countries as as you describe them here and um yeah so that that's an interesting point too all right keep going (laughs) unless you have nothing else i don't know yeah i mean that's kind of an even better point nick that you're making it's or this is how i'm interpreting it they almost and please take this for the way it is me just using kind of a cliche Oh, you're going to get, but you almost have like a a clean slate, right? Because there's a lot of even being industrialized and being in like a, I don't know, a non third world country or first world country. There's a lot of things that exist that are dangerous, such as how we do transportation or potentially maybe issues we're having with farming. But because of the situation we find ourselves in with technology, being able to go to a developing country and try and lay out an infrastructure in terms of like, how electricity will be laid in where food will be grown because now we can do it you know either out of a petri dish or coming in greenhouses there's a lot of ways that you can make that society totally self-sustainable and more efficient than trying to come into somewhere like let's say let's just say california for argument's sake and trying to introduce automated cars in a system where everybody really depends on getting themselves from a to b at a certain point in the day multiple times a week so you have, you're almost having to really kind of move a little bit backwards where in the developing country you can kind of start from scratch uh, in some regards. Yeah, send, I don't know, Nick, what what do you got? Well, first off, send all your hate mail to Don't Panic UX on Twitter. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. No. So so I'm thinking about the design aspect of this, right? So, so yes, the infrastructure is there, and we could design the infrastructure to 
to even be there in the first place. But if, if okay, so the infrastructure is there. How do we design for it, right? And I think it comes down to designing for ubiquity and um, being able to design for cross-cultural understanding, right? So we have, um, right now there's a lot of localization teams working hard on um, different products that translate well into the country that they, or to the language that it is being used in, right? So you'll often notice that there's plenty of language settings on some of your programs, English, French, Japanese, um, you name it, Spanish, it's all on there, right? And you can, you can tailor your program to whatever language you speak and whichever one you're comfortable with. So first off, there's the whole localization aspect, but there's design behind things like icons and, um, you know, uh, various visual cues that we can sort of rely on to span uh, cross cultures, right? And it, it's interesting because in develop in developing countries, or they may or may not understand what a floppy disk is for save, right? That's something inherently <laughs> distilled in us. We know that. That's a convention that we've established, but they it'll be interesting because they don't have the same conventions that we do. It, it'll all have to be learned. And so how do we design uh, these sort of um, visual cues that are going to span cross cultures? It's an interesting yeah, problem. Yeah, and I mean, that's, uh, that's an interesting point in that, like we, you even have from culture to cultures, for argument's sake, you have difference in what gestures mean or what colors are related to. So this like kind of technology kind of gives us a chance to develop a really like a universal language and how technology works or the message that it conveys to different cultures, even especially through symbology, right? Because now oh, we're yeah. talking about icons. Yeah, 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 for sure. Um, well, Blake, I honestly I don't have anything else for this one. Uh, the, the other, the only other thing I really have, and this is just to like, kind of like tack on to what's going on in AI. Um, since we're do we're like taking these really complex problems and trying to solve them with AI. Like we, we talked about using the development of AI algorithms to beat people at games and things like that, but developing that really intense problem solving, I think could be used to look at like learning curriculums for young students and developing programs that allow them to like go through an entire like I don't know set of grade school using maybe just like a tablet or something that's a bit a bit cheaper on the ho- hardware and software side, but can supplement not maybe not having established schools or having enough teachers to staff these schools. So kind of using technology as a way to advance education um, would be another another thing that I would look at. But that all. That again goes to like designing for an inch if an infrastructure is already there um, and those kind of things. But that's that's one way I would throw AI into the mix. Yeah, there's there's a lot of different ways. And and man, I I gotta hand it to you, UX Andreas. This was an awesome question. <laughs> it was awesome. I love this one. Yeah, this is so good. I'm actually now that the show's over, we've answered. I'll make sure to let him know or whatever. Of course, we'll let him know that he. Oh yeah. We answered it, but I want to know what he was thinking of. Cause I think there's, there's obviously like, cause I, if I'm not wrong, I know I follow him on Twitter. I think he's like studying UX and I wonder if this came up in class or something and how he would answer the question. So, oh yeah, yeah. Great yeah. question, dude. Yeah. And if you guys have any great questions like UX Andreas did, you can write in, uh, <laughs> you can hit us up on Twitter. Uh, we're at H factors podcast and be sure to use that HF cast hashtag did it right this time Blake uh, I know how to Twitter this is great no and and please please do please join that discussion we're always looking for interesting things to talk about and we want to make it meaningful to you guys so feel free to tweet at us uh, well I'm getting into the outro let's do it that's it for today everyone let us know what you think of uh, any of the news stories that we talked about it did you like them did you hate them did you think we missed something I, I think we missed something we're ending the show like 20 minutes <laughs> it's okay though it's a short. It's a short but sweet episode. I really like this episode. Can you tell I'm stalling for time? <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> if you have any news stories or anything you want us to cover, let us know. Follow us on social media. Head on over to the Human Factors Cast, LinkedIn, Facebook, or Twitter. 
like I said, at H Factors Podcast. You can join the discussion on our SoundCloud until they go under, because it's inevitable. We'll see. I don't know. You, or you can send us an email at humanfactorscast at gmail.com. If you're feeling really brave, leave us a voicemail at 901-646-1432. That's 901-646-1HFC. You can also support us on our Patreon. You know we bring these things to you ad-free because we love you. And you can do that at patreon.com slash humanfactorscast. Be sure to like, subscribe, review us on Apple Podcasts, the Google Play Store, or whatever your favorite podcast directory is. It's all good. It's all fair game. As long as we get those re- reviews, just make them good. And, of course, you can always reach us at our home on the web, humanfactorscast.com. Mr. Blake Arnstorff, thank you so much for hanging out with me, and I'm so glad you're back in the States. Where can our listeners find you if they want to hang out with you? Oh, you guys can always find me in any state or any country at Donut Don't Panic UX on Twitter. <laughs> Cause Donut Panic UX is taken. <laughs> yes, it is. As for me, I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me on LinkedIn or Twitter at Nick underscore Rome. I've been starting to do more tweets and streams and whatnot. I I don't know, I posted something about Fortnite the other day. Anyway, thanks again for tuning into Human Factors Cast. Until next time. It depends! It depends! Robots. Your favorite Disney character. Disneyland, it's Disneyland. Robots. AI. And StarCraft 2 and StarCraft 2.